Well, good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you all again. I'm so glad we can keep in touch this way. Right in the middle of what is a crisis that I'm sure we're going to talk about, well, forever. It's going to be a conversation piece for years, isn't it? Uh, just over three weeks into this now, and I do hope that you're feeling okay. And I also hope that you're keeping safe, as ever. Uh, also, I, I particularly want to just think about the people that are watching this uh, alone, uh, living by themselves. Uh, you must be desperate for some company at the minute. The irony is those of us that don't live alone are diff uh, also desperate for different company. Um, although, don't read anything into what I'm saying about the problems here in Brew Allen. Uh, but uh, I just know that we are a, a people that thrive on variety. It's, it's the cycle of life. So my thoughts are with you all, whether you are uh, by yourselves longing to meet other people or if you are with others longing to meet different people. <laughs> We're a funny, funny bunch, aren't we? Uh, and I'm so grateful, aren't you, for all the technology that enables us to keep in touch uh, and not feel so isolated. The volunteering is going very well. We have a really good number of people, both from our church and from other places. So I do hope that you uh, feel able and willing to take advantage of this volunteering, which you, of course you can access through the John Betjeman Centre or calling me directly. And if I can help, I will. If not, I'll put you in touch with the Betjeman Centre where we have even more volunteers. Uh, it's a good place to live, this part of North Cornwall. And it seems a safe place. And it also seems a very loving place at the minute. And we just thank God, don't we, for that, each of us. So I want to look at some of the stories of Easter, the great stories. We know that in the days after Easter, Jesus continued to appear to his followers. We know that because Paul mentions that in Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15. Here Paul writes this, Jesus appeared to Peter and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living when he was writing it though some, he said, had fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then he appeared to all the apostles. And last of all, says Paul, he appeared to me. Now, it's clear that those appearances were not apparitions or hallucinations. I mean, to publicly declare that you had seen a convicted political criminal alive, even though he'd been executed, in the middle of that febrile environment of Jerusalem that was under Roman occupation, well, to make those kind of statements would have been seen as an act of treachery with very serious consequences for those that made it. The accounts of Jesus' appearances were remembered, but also admitted that people have been part of them, right in the middle of a climate of fear and mistrust. But they still grew in number. People were still willing to say that they had seen Jesus alive. They discounted their fears, they are, their inevitable doubts, and shared it, told it. If not from the rooftops, they did share it with those who they trusted the most. And we're going to look over the next three weeks, three of these key stories. The early church treasured these experiences. They wanted to hear about them firsthand from those that had experienced, one, experienced them. And they became, this sharing of stories, the centerpiece of their first Sunday gatherings, along with the sharing of bread and wine, which has been part of Christian tradition since those very first days. The Gospels, all four of them, have similar but different and rather uncoordinated accounts of the resurrection, especially that first Easter morning. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise that the accounts of that Easter morning are not identical. Identical accounts would smack of, well, collusion. Any police officer will tell you that. Ironically, of course, at the later Hillsborough disaster hearings, one of the most telling pieces of evidence as to the collusion within those that should have been taking a more caring approach was how identical the reports were, even down to the very terminology. And that became evidence of inaccuracy, not accuracy. The varied, uncoordinated reports in the Gospels 
well, they feel like a confused time, a life-changing time, which is exactly what it turned out to be for every single one of the people that saw him. These accounts of Jesus appearing, they emerged in the early church, which had witnesses. These accounts had witnesses, credibility, and certainty. And I want to look at the three big ones over the next three Sundays. Partly because, well, of course, our Foreign Secretary, Dominic Rao, has extended the lockdown for at least another three weeks. So these three big stories are that conversation and experience on the road to Emmaus. We'll look at that today. Which included the meal with Jesus and then the two friends running back to Jerusalem and Jesus meeting them back there. The second great story, of course, is the story of Thomas, who's been come to be known as Doubting Thomas. He wasn't present when Jesus first appeared to the disciples as a group. And he just, for him, doesn't have enough evidence to believe. And the third one is in John's Gospel. John chapter 21 has a whole story about how Jesus cooks breakfast for his friends and then has unforgettable conversations with Peter and with, of course, the writer of that Gospel too. But before we start, I want to just show you a short video clip. It's a bit of fun, really. Just a couple of minutes. of uh, Just to set us up, really, for looking at this story of what has become known as the road to Emmaus. It's from the uh, children's film Shrek, although a lot of grown-ups tend to enjoy it, where an ogre, a monster, ends up falling in love and a princess falls in love with him. But he isn't at all what she expected. He falls a long way short for her expectations. You did it! You rescued me! You're amazing! You're... A little unorthodox, I'll admit, but thy deed is great, and thine heart is pure. I am eternally in your debt. <coughs> and where would a brave knight be without his noble steed? All right, I hope you heard that. She called me a noble steed. She think I'm a steed? <laughs> the battle is won. You may remove your helmet, good sir knight. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> Why not? I... I have helmet hair. Please, I would look upon the face of my rescuer. Oh, no, you wouldn't, Durst. But how will you kiss me? What? That wasn't in the job description. Maybe it's a perk. No, it's destiny. Oh, you must know how it goes. A princess locked in a tower and beset by a dragon is rescued by a brave knight. And then they share... True love's first kiss. Hmm? With Shrek? You think, wait, 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 you think that Shrek is your true love? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you think Shrek is your true love? <laughs> what is so funny? <laughs> Let's just say I'm not your type, okay? Of course you are. You're my rescuer. Now, now remove your helmet. Look, I really don't think this is a good idea. Just take off the helmet. I'm not going to. Take it off. No! Now! Okay! Easy! As you command, your highness. You're... an ogre. Oh, you're expecting Prince Charming? Well, yes, actually. I think there's a bit of a mistaken expectation on both sides, isn't there? Kissing him wasn't on the job description. And she certainly expected him to be more like Prince Charming and less like Shrek. Poor old Shrek has become a, well, a byword for not being very attractive, isn't it? Expectations are brought into every relationship. One of the things when I talk to couples that are about to get married is about managing expectations. I know when I was growing up, uh, I grew up in a manse. My father was a Methodist minister like I am. And of course, as a consequence, um, we lived in houses that were never ours. They were looked after by a committee, a team of people. All my parents were fantastic and took real care of the gardens. The property management was really done by 
well, other people who came in and fixed things, organized things and made it happen. So I grew up not seeing uh, parents managing buildings. My wife, Susan, her father built, he built the houses they lived in. I mean, he knew everything about the building, did it himself, sorted it out, only brought people in that he couldn't do himself. So when we married and had never discussed maintenance around the house, we both have very different expectations of how a building, a house that we would own, would be managed. Very different expectations. And of course, we bring those to every single relationship. And that's true of the story of the road to Emmaus. In a moment, we're going to look at one very interesting line within that. We'd hoped that he was going to be the one to rescue Israel, to redeem Israel. But this story, the drama of it, is unforgettable and one of the most loved of all the stories of Scripture. And it has some similarities with an experience I had this very week. Of course, as I'm recording this, we're only allowed to go out for an hour's exercise once a day from our homes. I guess if we drive to where we exercise, then we seem to have, or probably have broken the movement restrictions. But cycling from home is clearly permitted, of course. So this Sunday morning that's just gone, Easter morning, I decided to cycle very early on down the Camel Trail. We're very lucky, aren't we, to have such a, a beautiful part of the world so nearby. I was going to cycle down the, the trail and sit by the river because I knew it was at full tide, which is when it's at its most beautiful, early in the morning in full tide. And I was going to spend a few minutes to reimagine that first morning of what became the new age, the new possibilities, the new promise, because we now know what happens after death because of Jesus. So I was to ride about halfway, uh, stop, and then come back. Now I've done the trip many times up to Padstow on the Camel Trail, and I know that the journey from the Mance here in Weybridge down to Padstow is, well, it's just a little over six miles. And that's about the same distance from Jerusalem to the village of Emmaus, where Cleopas and his unnamed friend live. It says in the scriptures, now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. Now, even though it was very early when I went down to the trail on Sunday morning, there were a few other people around also exercising on cycles. Almost everybody greeted each other cordially, warmly but of course at an appropriate socially distanced two metres. Whilst I was out there, I passed three of our members. And as an experienced minister, I'm acutely attuned to spot a parishioner from a distance. However, I was aware that I was wearing a baseball cap, carrying a rucksack for my breakfast and my Bible, and I was wearing sunglasses because it was quite bright even that early. As a consequence, I'm not entirely sure that two of our members recognised who I was. They were warm and cordial, as you'd expect, but I don't think there was any recognition there. Now, if you're hearing this and it was you on the Camel Trail on Easter Sunday morning, I know who you are, and I'm really sorry if you did recognise me but didn't stop for health reasons. I mean, who can blame you for that? It says in the scriptures, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. And believe me, I'm not trying to draw comparisons between me and Jesus. I never, never successfully done that. But there was a third person, a third one of our members from our church, one of our churches. Now, they did recognize me. Now, they know who they are because, well, we stopped and we talked, two metres apart, of course. But when I cycled past them and called their name, they looked up. They looked surprised, astonished, in fact. 
Now, I was a little disappointed that they were astonished because, well, I assumed that their surprise and shock had come from the sight of me either up so early or exercising so enthusiastically. But actually, they weren't astonished for either of those reasons. Because with our eyes wide open looking at me, they pulled from their pocket their iPhone and turned to show me that at that very moment, they were listening to the YouTube Easter morning sermon that I had posted on YouTube for that very morning. And right here's the real thing, they said. It was a coincidence that was the shock. It was so unexpected. The two men walking the trail to Emmaus were talking to Jesus. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, it says, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas, he asked Jesus, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he said. So busy talking about him and coming to a conclusion about him whilst on their journey, they describe Jesus to what they thought was a travelling stranger. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. But as we so often do, they then moved on from a description to a judgment, to an assessment. We do that a lot. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over, they said, to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped, we'd hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem, to rescue Israel. That had been our expectation. And now he's dead. He wasn't that. He wasn't at all what we had hoped what we'd expected him to be. What a disappointment. One of the great family films, which we seem to watch most Christmases even now, is of course The Wizard of Oz, which is the story of a great journey, a, a rescue story, that's the point of it. Uh, this tremendous mid-war uh, story. But of course, at the end of it, it has a tremendous, well, disappointment that they're expecting to find, expecting to find this great character. But it's not at all what they expected. Just have a quick look at this short two minute clip. Now we can go back to the wizard and tell him the wicked witch is dead. The wicked witch is dead, and I believe my eyes. Why have you come back? Please, sir, we've done what you told us. We brought you the broomstick of the wicked witch of the West. We melted her. Ah, oh, you liquidated her, eh? Very resourceful. Yes, sir. So we'd like you to keep your promise to us, if you please, sir. Not so fast. Not so fast. I'll have to give the matter a little thought. Go away and come back tomorrow. Tomorrow? Oh, but I want to go home now. You've had plenty of time already. Yeah. Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said, come back tomorrow. If you are really great and powerful, you keep your promises. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures. Think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. Oh. The great Oz has spoken. Oh. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The great and Oz has spoken. Who are you? Oh, I, I, I am the great and powerful wizard of Oz. You are? Uh, I yes. don't believe you. No, I'm afraid it's true. There's no other wizard except me. You humbug! Yeah. Yes, it's exactly so. I'm a humbug. Oh, you're a very bad man. Oh, no, my dear. I, I'm a very good man. I'm just a... Very bad wizard.
When I hear that statement that they had hoped he would rescue Israel, I think there's clear disappointment in their voice, therefore in their hearts. It says their faces were downcast, which is a, a well-known physical image of disappointment. Jesus crucified was a disappointment to them at that time. He had not lived up to their expectations. He had not fulfilled their, their idea of his mission. He had failed in the job description that they had laid out in their own minds for him. I mean, disappointment is such a powerful emotion. I mean, it's so powerful that for most children, it's not the threat of punishment that encourages compliant behavior, but rather the desire to avoid a sense of paternal disappointment. Disappointment crushes people. It breaks hearts. It weakens wills. It drains away energy for battles, and it drains away energy even for life itself. Each of you will have known, to some degree, disappointment very deep in your life. A disappointment that may well have affected your will, your energy, and even your sense of value. And because this experience is so powerful and so common, so much part of a flawed world, I have become convinced that one of the reasons, the many reasons, that the gospel writers and editors that gathered these memories kept this story is for those who have been so disappointed in life and may even be disappointed with God. I've learned that to follow Jesus is not easy. We all know something about taking up a cross. But I've also learned this, that our sense of disappointment, though feeling very real, is not the way things really are. You see, what Cleopas's disappointment stemmed from was his own interpretation of events. He was disappointed because of the story he was telling himself about Jesus. That is what was leading him to this conclusion. And ironically, he had come to that conclusion whilst the very real thing was right there in front of him. In front of Cleopas's small, self-pitying story was Jesus himself. Just by being there, by being alive, by being risen, he was demonstrating and proving that he was, in fact, the very thing that Cleopas had wanted him to be, but in a completely unexpected, ambitious, spiritual, eternal, meaningful, and deeper way. So then, walking along the road, Jesus invited them into, well, the bigger story of what was really going on. Bigger than his feelings, bigger than his fears, bigger than his disappointment. Because although that was part of it, it wasn't the whole story. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And having then drawn a new story for them, written one, explained it, showed them. Showed them that this may not be a disappointment, this crucifixion, but the beginning of something more. He then sat down with them for a meal. Verse 30 says, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. And it was then at this meal that something happened. It's difficult for us to know who Cleopas actually was. There is no clear historical record, but one theory, a strong theory, is that Cleopas was one of the many followers who had gathered around the 12 disciples and he may well have been at that unforgettable meal where Jesus had broken bread and said, take and eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. 
or perhaps the Cleopas in Luke is the same person called Clopas in John chapter 20. In James Version calls him in John Cleophas. There are variations in the spellings in all the Gospels, in the earliest of the documents. If that's true, if Cleopas was the Clopas mentioned, then Clopas was married to Jesus' mother's sister. That would mean that, well, he would have been Jesus' uncle by marriage. Now that does tell us something. They were family. Families are famous in the movies for supporting each other. But internally, I've often found the dynamics to be a lot more nuanced or difficult or complicated. Internally, I found that family relationships have quite a lot of disappointment. We tend to create expectations on our families that are so much higher than we put on anyone else. And as a, cons as a consequence, very few can truly fulfill them all. So it's no surprise for me that if Cleopas was Jesus' uncle, if he was expecting something greater from Jesus, than just a grubby, pointless execution. But if he was family and he had shared the table and shared bread with him many times, I wonder if he recognised Jesus when he gathered around a meal table, saw him give thanks to his heavenly father and then shared the bread by serving them in a home that wasn't his. Verse 31 says, it was then that their eyes were opened. Then they recognized him, but disappeared from their sight. And that moment of experience, that moment of sharing the bread, or well, from that point on for Cleopas, well, Jesus ceased to be a disappointment. In fact, from that time, Jesus approached them, things had started to be different. There's that wonderful phrase, isn't there? It says this, were not our hearts burning while he talked to us with, on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And I want to suggest this morning, or, or ask you really, that if God has been a disappointment to you, and real faith dares to whisper such things, the that the resurrected Jesus changes all that. And it changed them. They got up, it says in verse 33, and immediately at once they returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them all assembled together. And they were saying to each other, it is true. The Lord is risen. Now, it does mean that there are parts of your life where just as Cleopas had to unpick his story, which Jesus helped him through by showing him how his interpretation of Jesus' death was not really what was going on. You may need to unpick parts of your story. You may need to unpick your version of events. See, what you had hoped for may have been mistaken or self-centered or too small. You may not have fully realized that a God who loves you will always have something bigger and better for you than even you can imagine. And above all, we need to realize that a God who fails at your job description or my job description of him, if he fails at that job description, well, he's not the God of Jesus Christ at all. In fact, he'd be unrecognizable. The resurrection of Jesus forces a rewrite of every version, of every true story, and every real disappointment. You see, from now on, none of our disappointments are wasted. None of our struggles are meaningless or pointless. In fact, because of his resurrection, all that you and I go through are leading somewhere better. 
we grow, we learn, we love better, we listen more carefully, we long for justice. Our appetite for something better grows day by day through our disappointments. So don't allow that version of events to shape you. Don't allow our mistaken self-pitying attitudes, and we all have them. Don't let that shape who we are. Instead, on this road to Emmaus, Jesus explained, taught, showed, mentored, inspired them. So let him, let him and his teaching and his friends rewrite your version of the events that have left such a mark on you. His version, his story will be more accurate, more powerful. He'll have a loving and a lead role to play in every part. And even when you didn't realize it, he was there. And he will be truly recognizable as the alive Jesus Christ. And don't be surprised if the disappointed, downcast you is the one who's no longer recognizable. Rather than looking at a story of failed expectations, which we started with, I want to finish by showing you a, a different end to a film. A child lost at the beginning of the war is separated from his parents for six years. And over those six years, he has grown and aged and he doesn't look quite the way he once did. Through the film, he goes to a number of adventures and at one point says that he can't remember what his parents look like. But in this wonderful film by Steven Spielberg, The Empire of the Sun, at the end, the two come together. They don't know what to expect, the mother or the child or even the father. But when they meet, it says this. It says this in scripture, he will wipe every tear from our eye. He'll leave our hearts burning. Because it's true. He's alive. And calling it home.
Father, we are so conscious that the version of our story, the version of events, has not always been accurate. And we pray that you will come into our lives, into our hearts, into our minds, and explain, show us. Show us your bigger story. Show what resurrection means today so that we are no longer afraid, angry, damaged, hurting, or uncertain where to go. Father, you come to us. You bread with us. And we are grateful people. So don't leave us alone on the road. Join us and enter our very hearts and homes. Amen. Well, God bless. Keep safe. I'll speak to you again next week, if not during the week. And uh, I do hope that uh, those that you're closest to remain safe. Uh, keep praying. And above all, let's keep safe together. Amen. Bye-bye. God bless.